We feel that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Eulon tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Can't have feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone sticks me on. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Varm Blogging. Today I'm here with Freddie DeVore, author of The Cult of Smart and maintainer of Freddie DeVore over on Substack. Um, which I guess is where your work is primarily at these days. Yeah, I uh, I freelance a little bit, but um, not very much. I mean, frankly, um, I just get a much better dollar per word from writing for my newsletter than I do um, for uh, an external publisher. So, Yeah, the, people ask me why I don't do a lot of political article writing, and I'm like, because it's not worth my time and money or even necessarily an exposure so i mean i you know for me like in my heyday a lot of it was just stamp collecting like i just wanted to be able to say i've been published here and here and here and that just stops having any novelty after a certain point and you look around and you realize that you're you know making like ten dollars an hour to write these things so yeah um so your um blog newsletter the, this precise distinction between a newsletter and a blog and a blog seems to just be what decade it's in but it's true. um <laughs> um has been kind of doubling down hard on the way that let's say the progressive liberal left and it's slightly left of center allies have been taking a giant gun and aiming it directly at their foot and then pulling it over and over again until there's not even a stub left. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I know that you would probably not put it that violently and directly as me, but it, it seems to me like what you're recording lately has been a bunch of trends on discourse patterns and uh, career arcs that have really kind of pernicious effects in the way the broader public views, um, let's say, the progressive and the, the Democratic Party. Um, do you feel, do you still feel that way or has it gotten worse lately? How does it, how have things change since Trump is no longer uh, the bet nor everybody's aiming at? Yeah, I just think that um, uh, we really are in a, an unfortunate scenario where um so let, let's maybe, maybe sort of pull back to the top mm -hmm. level the fundamental problem in many ways is what many liberals and democrats say which is that at the national level uh conservatives have structural advantages because of not just the existence of the senate but because of just the way that this uh, that the states are laid out and the way that the population is laid, is laid uh, weighed out. People who are um, dominantly Republican voters um, are overrepresented in the process. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't want to chalk up the inability of Joe Biden to pass a, a progressive agenda or uh, anything like that. <clears throat> you know, just lay that on the feet of, um, excuse me, the professional managerial class that I don't like. Um, it is the case that, you know, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema are two of the biggest opponents of, of any kind of progressive agenda. Um, and as Matt Iglesias likes to point out often, the alternative to those two bad Democrats are worse Republicans. In other words, um, in a world in which Joe Manchin was not the uh, conservative Senate a Democrat from West, uh, West Virginia, there would instead be a conservative Republican for West Virginia. And so in that sense, right, um, you know, the, the Senate is uh, 
uh, a body that um, would seem to reward moderation in the sense that um, <clears throat> you have to have the possibility of peeling off states or seats in states that um, have populations that are at least potentially amenable to this, right? So in other words, you know, the reason why a Bernie Sanders is functionally less powerful than a Joe Manchin um, has something to do with the fact that, um, you know, a, a Joe Manchin can get elected in West Virginia, right, where Bernie Sanders could not. Uh, and the replacement player from uh, Vermont is another the Democrat, whereas the replacement for Joe Manchin is a Republican, right? So right. They're just in the simple sense in which in like any kind of plausible near term future, um, the people who are representing the progressive side of the Democratic Party um, are all in safe seats. Um, I think one of the really funny things about um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez becoming many like people sort of progressive champion, you know, there's so many articles written about her and how she had taken on the machine and won. Um, I'm glad that she's there instead of Joe Cobb. I think that was the guy who was who had her super spot. But he literally didn't run because he had run unopposed so often and his seat was considered safe that he just essentially did not mount a primary campaign at all. And so it was outworked on the ground there. And that becomes even more stark when you realize that in the campaign that mattered, right? Like once AOC won the uh, uh, the nomination for that, the congressional district, she was going to become the Democratic representative because there was no chance in hell that the people in North Brooklyn were going to be sending a Republican to Congress, right? right. In that primary election, uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez got less than 18,000 votes, right? So if you talk about like the big picture media scene and everyone looking for these green shoots of like a rebirth of progressivism or of socialism or farther left figures, you know, AOC is someone who, you know, was able to get some 18,000, you know, uh, Brooklynites to pull the lever for her. So that that's not indicative of anything other than particularly weird scenarios in far lefty places. Whereas, again, um, in Pennsylvania, John Fetterman, uh, I think it's John Fetterman or Fetterman, um, you know, literally looks like he walked in out of a, a Harley Davidson ad and uh, <clears throat> still faces a very large challenge uh, in, you know, what has always been you know, purple Pennsylvania. So and I, I, I give you that big preamble because I, I, I think I don't want to uh, sort of give the impression that I think these structural issues are the part of the sort of discourse norms of, of you know, uh, educated liberal elites. However, it is a fact that um, there is a profound uh, difference between uh, how people who attend fancy colleges, graduate from them, go live in urban enclaves and get jobs in careers that are part of the ideas industry, like media, academia, or think tanks, and who become staffers on democratic campaigns. Those people are systematically, dramatically different from the median American. They're also systematically, dramatically different from the median Democrat. Right. So and this is another thing that, you know, um, the activist class of the of the Democratic Party um, has enormous sort of at least intellectual and social and cultural sway within the, the institutions of the party. Um, and it's they're all coming from people who uh, came up through a certain kind of siphon and hose of having a certain ideology and self-presentation. And yeah, I think that self-presentation, the vocabulary, the fixations, the agenda uh, is uh, contrary to what you need in order to be a nationally competitive party. And um, I think that uh, the way that I would probably describe the, 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 the sort of big picture problem here is uh, there's something called the Iron Law of Institutions. Mm -hmm. This guy John Schwartz came up with it, which mm -hmm. is... <clears throat> Within an institution, if you look at human behavior within institutions, um, people will always do what's best for their position within the institution rather than doing what's best for the institution itself. In other words, if there's a conflict where someone within an institution can do something that will help the institution but hurt their own place within the institution, they don't do it. So like a classic sort of theoretical example might be... Um, <clears throat> 
you are a vice president at some big corporation and you head your, you, you know, head your own division. And over time, you have become convinced that your division doesn't need to exist, that it's a redundancy, that you can slash that division and reassign some of the people and lay off a bunch of, of other ones, save a lot of money, make the institution, make your, your corporation a leaner and more profitable machine. But doing so, you would no longer be a division head. You would lose face and lose position within the institution. And Schwartz's point is like, people don't do that. Right. Like if you just if you just study human behavior in general, they almost always privilege their own place within the institution. Right. So right now you have that classic uh, situation where um, I think there's a lot of people who quietly know that um, the uh, absolute fixation on a very abstract vision of, of racial politics, the constant vocabulary policing, uh, the uh, sort of uh, demands to put some people first in ways that are politically un unpalatable, the attachment to um, issues that pull very po poorly and that we have no reason to believe people support. Um, those things, I think there's a lot of people within the Democratic Party right now, even within the activist wing, who know that that stuff is hurting the party. But if they were to criticize it, right, it would damage their uh, uh, position within the party itself, within the apparatus, right? Because <clears throat> you've got this um, social culture that, you know, is uh, highly online and very much tied to, you know, to youth culture and to the discourse norms of the internet and social media that is uh, very informed by the sort of weird lumpy vision of socialism so-called that has become popular. So I think that people are just not, they're just not willing to rock the boat and hurt their own potential climb up the ladder within the party, but also just within the big apparatus of institutional liberalism in this country. This is particularly true of what they call the groups, which the groups for the Democrats is just like, um, it's the nonprofits and the foundations and the think tanks that um, constantly produce position papers and uh, uh, and uh, call for specific kinds of strategic political action, et cetera. Those groups are very, very influential because a lot of people graduate out of being low level staffers into working at one of those foundations, at one of those think tanks, right? It's an extremely important sort of set of make, make work jobs for um, upperly mobile young liberals. And, um, those institutions have just marched farther and farther left for decades. And so I think we're just in a really in a, in a, in a deep problem where um, <clears throat> the people who uh, are the ones who could arrest this uh, pursuit of a deeply unpopular vocabulary and, and policy agenda um, are people who think that if they if they dare to question it, they could lose face within their career. They don't want to do that. Well, this leads us to a couple of paradoxes, though. I mean, one... Uh, the obvious one is while you're absolutely right that the scuttling of the democratic agenda cannot be blamed on the discourse patterns of, you know, a, a group of activists and professionals, um, the fact that the brand is toxic, however, can be. Um, and it's even becoming toxic to to other kinds of leftists. It's just they, like if you see the current shifts, and some of these are wild and chaotic, but they seem to be a response to the toxicness of the brand of not just Democrats, but also the progressives and the socialists, uh, the Democratic Socialists aligned with them. Um, but I want to dig in a little bit on this on this thing because you actually. You know, your point about Vermont is interesting because Vermont is pretty much the only counterexample that I have to the cultural drift of formerly democratic states into conservative states. Mm -hmm. um, because Vermont was a formerly conservative state that the Bernie Sanders campaign in the 80s did manage to shift incrementally but it took a long time to do even you know beyond burlington and i think and and interestingly i don't think the bernie sanders campaign has ever really tried to do it at the national level at all like 
um, particularly not after 2016. Um, I don't know what to make of that because except for the kinds of things that you're arguing that there's an institutional logic that even someone like uh, out um, from ostensibly the outside who was willing to even be a willing to consider being a record candidate in, in 2012 um will not risk the further along they get um and that doesn't bode well for re for rebuilding a uh a, a political movement that is increasingly associated with an executive government that may be the least popular in modern history mm -hmm. like <clears throat> yeah but i would i would add like a a little sweetener to this which is you made you pointed out vermont is a more conservative state that became very liberal um what part of this, one of the things that happened coincidentally to that at the same time as that is um, Vermont has become quite an expensive place to live. Um, it is, um, uh, my girlfriend and I are moving out of Brooklyn sooner or later, and we went up there, to get a lay of the land of the real estate, and it, it blew me away how expensive the housing is. And, um, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole history there of like, it's a sort of laid back little agricultural state. And then hippies start to come up there in the 60s and create communes and stuff. And that sort of creates a base of sort of lefty thinking. And then um, it's very picturesque. It's also close enough that you can drive to New York in a fairly um, convenient amount of time. And so, like, you know, a lot of Vermont moving left was tied to a change uh, to its socioeconomic character, right? It's much more highly educated now. And it's significantly richer than it once was. And <clears throat> this is one of the things... That, you know, looking at the big picture, it's like education polarization is now a stronger predictor than race, right? So in other words, <clears throat> college educated, um, you know, whether you're college educated or not is a stronger predictor of whether you're going to vote Democrat or Republican than your racial background, um, <clears throat> which would have blew people's minds 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the, and, you know, there's all sorts of- it's also of a stronger things. predictor than class or income. That's true, yeah. Um, there's all kinds of sort of potential reasons for why people who go to college become more liberal. There just was a big paper that came out that said that it's not just selection effects, that people, that there's actually like a um, college sort of creation, uh, uh, college actually does meaningfully move people to the left. And you can say that in ways that are flattering to, to, to Democrats, like, you know, people get smarter and they learn more about the world and they become more accepting and more socially responsible. Or you can say it in a way that's unflattering and just say, oh, you know, it's the indoctrination factories, whatever, indoctrination factories. But um, <clears throat> so much of the Democrats' growth uh, since the 2008 Obama campaign um, has come from um, white people with college degrees becoming a solidly democratic bloc. Um, we know that uh, uh, Hispanic uh, voters have moved up strikingly far to the direction of the Republicans uh, in the last uh, three or four um, presidential elections. Um, you know, black people, there's just there's just a ceiling effect. There's just not there just isn't much more, you know, unpicked fruit in terms of black people who vote. Um, they're already all voting Democrat anyway, you know, um, and there has been a little bit of a little bit of GOP movement among black men, not about among black women. Um, so you can't count on Hispanics being uh, the engine of the party's growth in the future, like everybody thought we could for decades. Um, black people are only twelve and a half percent of the population, and they're already dominantly Democratic. Um, so you're just putting more and more pressure on needing to get all these college-educated whites. Um, the question is, is like, is that scalable and for how long? Um, it's just, I mean, look, we, you and I had an hour and a half long conversation on this show uh, about, about among other things, the folly of college for everyone. Right. Yep. And, um, the, the model is not sustainable, uh, in part because, um, we can't get people through the pipeline. Right. It's still the case that half the people who start college never, never finish. Um, and uh, we're tapping out on, uh, I mean, you know, almost everyone who has college level academic ability and at least minimal financial security to be been able to begin school and take out loans 
um, is already in the pipeline, right? In other words, like this is, you know, colleges nationwide are beating the bushes, excuse me, are beating the bushes to try to get some um, more to juice enrollments because it just seems like everybody's fighting for the same students. And there's a lot of people who self-select out of college because they know they're not going to like it or not going to do well. And then meanwhile, you know, we have a totally fucked uh, college uh, financing system where um, a, a, a meaningful percentage of people are only able to get through college by taking on backbreaking debt. And so, you know, if you're a democratic strategist, I think the question that you have to ask yourself is, is like, okay, like, can we really continue to uh, uh, churn out, you know, new, newly minted baby faced liberal Democrats because they went to Amherst College, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, the, the, that does not strike me as being like a sustainable kind of a thing. Um, and as David Shore, who you mentioned, you know, always points out, it's like, you know, Obama won uh, in large measure because a significant portion of the white working class voted for him. But core to this ideology that we're talking about, I mean, one of the most deeply ingrained attitudes among them is that they don't want us to reach out to uh, uh, uneducated whites. They don't want us to reach out to uneducated uh, white people uh, people who are in the Rust Belt, people who are, suffer from deindustrialization, that like that is always cast in terms, no matter what, how you frame it, that a, appeal is always caught, uh, cast in terms of like you just you, you're pandering to Trump voters, you want to put white people first, whatever. And so it's like at some point, where are the voters going to come from, right? Like you you have to build up a certain level of constituency, and there's just not that many black women. Right. There just isn't that many um, uh, progressive, uh, uh, co you know, college, uh, recent college graduates. Uh, there's an enrollment crunch right now because uh, that the college age population is actually dipped. I mean, I just I don't I don't get the math. If it's if it's really true that Hispanic voters are moving to the right, then. There just is there's just no alternative. The Democrats trying to reach uh, sort of culturally conservative uh, white working class voters. What fascinates to me that there's a bunch of things that fascinate me about this because we're always told that by 20, uh, 2048 or twenty fifty, this will be a, a majority minority country, but then that is sold as if the trends of black voters going back to the end of the new deal will be the trends of everyone involved, despite the fact that that is historically only kind of true after 2006, mm. actually very recent that Latino and Asian voters could be counted on as a democratic constituency mm. at all. Right. Um, and it peaked in 2012. So, with a, trans with a transformative candidate, I mean, I'm not a, a big right. Obama fan, but with a guy who was a totally unique pol in political presence with outrageous levels of talent and charisma and someone who sold a post-racial message, right? Like, right? like the black president was not the one saying, no, we need to censor black people. The black president was the one saying, we all need to come together and be a community of brothers, or whatever, whatever you know. This is the shit that he said. So it's just, a, it's just like the guy who did, who pulled it off is speaking and spoken exactly the terms that you don't like, you know. And and I don't mean to go all Adolf Reed on people, but there's also a, a sense in which the educated uh, educated minority groups, because of structural race, racism, actually, um, tend to be richer than even their white counterparts. So they're even more removed from uh, working class opinion of the of the racial group. So they often just don't know. Right. Um, and uh, the, the other reality that I think people don't want to deal with is the Black Congressional Caucus assumed a lot of the Dixiecratic machinery when, when the Ds changed to Rs in the late 90s, early aughts. Um, and they cut deals with those former Dixie cats to turn Republicans to make safer seats at the expense of any progressive growth 
in the South. The reason why it took Georgia so long to become kind of purple, mm-hmm. and it didn't at the state level, I may add, um, are those deals. All right. And the like ProPublica reported on it 10 years ago. It's become almost impossible to talk about. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to go after nomenclature, but I thought the shift to BIPOC was interesting because I would say black, indigenous, people of color. Okay. So you're forwarding black and indigenous. And for reasons of historical grievance, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But for reasons of size of population, that absolutely doesn't make right. sense. Right. Um, well, it's even like here, here's an interesting wrinkle of the whole permanent, you know, the emerging Democratic majority argument. Um, I think it's important to say that, like, it was it, it, it's wrong, right? The, the browning of America is not reliably producing large Democratic majorities, um, in part because Hispanic people are moving to the right as a class. But another thing that happened is so it when when the, some of the original political science work that was done to create these projections, excuse me, to create these projections that um, became the enduring Democratic majority myth, um, they weren't just saying, okay, here's the rate of growth of Black people, the rate of growth of Hispanic people, the rate of growth of, of Asian people's relative to white. What a lot of the, the pioneering research did was they looked at, at patterns of outmarriage and they noted that there was happening more and more often, right? So, so marriage outside of one's own race, pr- producing more people of mixed race, right? Multiracial people, mixed race people. Um, they then extrapolated from that and said, okay, mixed race people are in fact the furthest leaning racial demographic. Right. If you include mixed race people, they are actually to the left of even of black uh, Americans. They're the, they're the furthest left uh, demographic. So they said, OK, <clears throat> we're going to have this X million number of new mixed race people. And they're, they, they're going to vote Democrats because mixed race people are Democrats. Um, the problem with that was is that um, uh, it turns out that what matters is not like your quote unquote real race. What matters politically is how you self-identify your race. And there's a lot of people who have one white parent and one parent of another race who identify as white and vote according to white patterns. In other words, when they were doing this, they just thought there was some some thing as the mixed race voter and that they could predictably say that they'll vote ex-Democrat and ex-Republican. But what they didn't count on was the fact that um, a lot of mixed race people choose to identify with one of, the, of their racial backgrounds um, and can reliably be expected to vote according to that rather than to the sort of mixed race category. So what I find interesting, too, is when you. And there's a lot of there's a lot of weird essentialist assumptions and a lot of the racial talk on this mm-hmm. because it assumes for me, it always assumed that. Uh, Latin voters would always vote a certain way because basically it was in their interest to do so, regardless of whether or not, A, there was ever meaningful immigration reform, which the Democrats have not really even attempted, um, and B, um, whether or not uh, integration into the larger society was, was possible, and also they assumed a homogeneity amongst Latinos and amongst people in color in general, which is wild to me. Yeah. Um, because I'm like, okay, Chicanos uh, who've been in Texas for three generations don't vote the same way as uh, Cubanos who don't also don't vote the same way as Venezuelans who don't vote the same way as people from Latin America. Like it's, I mean, from Central America, it, because their interest and class differences are different, and none of them reflect uh, reflect African American trends for a variety of reasons. One of the things you should point out to people is like, okay, African American men uh, who are often employed in municipal services because it's where they actually enforce anti-immigration laws the most consistently. I mean, not anti-discrimination laws most consistently. Um, 
that really wasn't as open to uh, Latin immigrants because they tend to come speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so what trends you see there are trends in, uh, yes, there's some municipal employment, yet, but a lot of people are small business owners, right? Mm -hmm. That's predictive of certain traits once you remove stuff like immigration. And what, what I was listening to, uh, you know, for all my radical politics aside, I've been listening to a lot of like 538 and I was listening to just normal pollsters talking to Latino people. And they're like, well, we don't believe you're ever going to do anything about the issues that we cared about with the Democrats. So why should we be loyal when you're also seemingly running the economy into the ground and we're small business owners and these, these tax margins actually hurt us and being forced to close during COVID hurts mm -hmm. us and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, I think it, I, I mean, a quintessential example of what you're talking about is happening along the, the Mex uh, Mexican Texas border, which is you have illegal immigrants, so people who uh, have green cards who are, or, or have citizenship. Um, they are small business owners, like you said, specifically, many of them uh, own their own cattle ranches, right? If you just generically said to someone, hey, uh, I know a guy who is lives in Texas in a rural part of the state, is a devout Catholic and a small business owner. You know, what would you assume his party would be? Nine times out of 10, they'd say that person would be a Republican because those are all Republican things, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that that person is Mexican, right, doesn't overwhelm all of those other, uh, all of those other uh, attributes. And I also think this is the thing that drives people crazy, but I, I do think it's true. I think that if you look around, at, um, you can find evidence out there that uh, recent legal immigrants uh, not only are not more progressive on immigration, but can be considerably more conservative on, on uh, undocumented immigration because they have the feeling I went through the process, I did the work, I paid the money, I took the fucking citizenship class, so you can too, right? But like, but the problem, and that ang that anger is real. The problem is, is that like, the the notion that that could be a thing, right, cuts against the intersectional philosophy. So people just don't even engage with it. They just say it's not true, you know. Yeah. You know, the other the other big one is uh, how conservative voting patterns tend to be are on reservations. Mm -hmm. um, the exception to that is the is the large reservation. So like the. The Navajo Reservation and the Dine Nation it voted Democratic this last election round, but that's actually historically abnormal even there. Mm -hmm. um, and again, weirdly a proof of systemic racism. One of the reasons why a lot of good progressive activists don't really know this is because they really only know highly educated indig indigenous right. activists. Right. They don't know people from the res. Um, it, you know, this is a big deal out here in the West, but it's like, it's something that I've been, that I've been dealing with, um, a fair amount with, with some of the work is like a lot of well-meaning liberal and left activists encounter like actual social attitudes on the reservation and they don't know what to do because it mm -hmm. does not fit what they, what they have been constructing, um, based off of basically literature and in theoretical literature at that. And uh, I, I've also been pointing out these patterns even go into unions. So for example, uh, the, the, the Utah teachers union used to be really militant and it wasn't because it was, it wasn't because it was progressive. It just used to be really militant, but that has declined rapidly over the past 30 years, despite Utah being one of the few western states where there's a high a high penetration of teachers in the union mm. um and that's in quotation marks because it's still like usually less than 20 percent mm. uh but one of the ironies is is because of administrative cost um it's way cheaper to join the union Sorry. and no problem it's way cheaper to join the union if you're in a rural district so for example one of the reasons why the union was so torn during COVID and what work actions should be is because rural districts had completely different concerns with than urban ones. And despite that the urban school systems are larger, way larger, 
the low level of penetration of union membership, meaning that they were actually pretty much equally represented in the union debates. Mm -hmm. Now, I only know that because I'm in the union, but it, it was like it was nearly impossible to come to any conclusions about what we should do because one, I mean, everyone thinks it's just political, but I've actually pointed out to people like, well, what you need to do in a rural area to respond to COVID and what you need to do in an urban area to respond to COVID are actually different anyway. Right. Like social distancing in a rural area is kind of already happening in a lot of cases. Like, um, I mean, it, it, you know, if you want to they name like a muscular far left American teacher union, you, you talk about the, the CTU, Chicago's teacher union. Um, they had they just had some kind of a uh, internal union election. I don't know much about it, but I heard from someone involved that it was a very nasty fight. And um, as with any union, um, particularly teachers unions, you know, a lot of that stuff is really inside baseball stuff about seniority and you know and retirements and tenure or whatever. But part of it was, you know, the sort of thing that um, CTU became the, the sort of the national face of teachers who don't want to reopen schools and go back to work, uh, which has proven to be deeply unpopular. Uh, and there, it seems that there's been some serious uh, learning loss about it. I just think it's so fascinating. You know, there was a time around like 2012 or so where it really did seem to me that um, the sort of ed reform, neoliberal ed reform revolution really was going to come and sweep through the country, where you had bipartisan commitment to charter schools. You had Arne Duncan as Barack Obama's secretary of education, who um, never met a teacher he didn't want to scapegoat or a school he didn't want to close. Uh, you had all these, these programs in major cities like New York, in Los Angeles, these lefty cities, you know, had tons of charter programs and all kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, the, the the states that all spun up these new uh, uh, tests to uh, standardized tests to, to sort of show compliance to uh, every student succeeds, which was the successor to uh, No Child Left Behind, um, and it just seemed like people had won the argument. Right. Like it really had seemed like just that like and I mean, I've been fighting against the, the neoliberal ed, ed reform movement since I've been writing about anything. But it really had seemed like they had just like like they had all the momentum on their side. And then it just sort of died, you know. Um, and I think we may have talked about this, but, um, you know, um, so there's a blogger named Education Realist. And one of the things that they point out is that um, like. So there's the there was the opt out movement, which is basically, yep. you know, affluent parents, parents with social stature um, became angered at the amount of testing that their kids were going through. Um, I, you know, my feeling is that part of what they were angry about is that the tests were revealing that their kids weren't as smart as they thought they were. But um, also, the opt -out, yeah. yeah, so the, the opt out movement started and it got a lot of press because, again, these are like bougie upper you know, middle class liberal parents who can sort of get a little press. But what Education Realized po points out is that like um, a lot of states were looking for an excuse to, to scale back their testing because the testing en ended up being extremely expensive. Um, what a lot of people don't remember about um, No Child Left Behind is it only had money for the initial development of tests. Yep, not for maintaining them. And not for maintaining them. And so all these states suddenly find like, wait, we need to find $55 a student uh, a year uh, to, to do the test that we've just put on the, on the books. So, you know, the, the idea is just that, like, the opt-out movement is actually, like, was kind of good for the states looking to sort of pinch some pennies. Um, but, like, and then, you know, we ran headlong into this argument that testing is racist, that, you know, um, uh, any kind of, like, way of, of, of ranking students is, is bigoted, whatever. And it was just remarkable to me. And I just thought, like, wow, like, it seemed like the teachers' unions might really be on the brink of uh, getting wiped out in a lot of places. Then it all evaporated. And then the fucking, this COVID thing comes along and it, I just couldn't believe how they were sticking their, their, their foot in their mouths. Like you have all these, these unions saying like, Oh, I mean, if you, there's, you know, union spokespeople who are saying like, Oh, don't talk to me about learning loss. That's not what, what our students need. We don't, we don't think of it in that term. And it's like, 
So you're telling the world that the service you perform doesn't have positive value, right? Like if you're saying that the kids can stay home as long as you want them to, and that they're not going to lose out on anything by not being in your presence, then you're just arguing against your own job. Anyway, it's kind of a digression, but. No, I mean, but it is a wild, it's a wild scenario. I will, the only thing I will say is the learning loss also occurred in states where they didn't keep the kids out. So like in Utah, we had two and a half years of learning loss too. Mm -hmm. um, and we only were shut down for the first six months. Uh, the, but it was wild. I was often just, I was confused at what the message was. I was even saying stuff like, okay, why are we arguing about elementary school teachers' risk when the risk is exponentially different from elementary and high school? Now, I'm a high school teacher, admittedly. But, but like, there was no evidence. Even I agreed that, like, you need to close the elementary schools. There was none. Mm -hmm. And remote learning doesn't work well for anybody without a lot of support. Mm -hmm. um, but... It particularly doesn't work well with younger students. And I was like, why are you doing this? Like, there's no reason to. And it was a weird flex. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, it, unfortunately, actually, in the case of, say, Utah, uh, and I don't know if this is true in other states, but you saw a high percentage of union membership in the beginning. And then a massive decline. Well, uh, maybe not massive, but a significant decline in union membership about six months in because neither side was happy. Like, um, and in fact, a lot of us wanted what we wanted uh, here was just like, we just want more protections to go in and do our job in a safer environment mm -hmm. with actual space. There's no way to do that. Like, you know, or there is a way to do it, but it's really expensive. Like go and fix the evac systems, um, reduce class sizes and stuff like that. And that there's not the political will for that. And so what you got was basically the worst of all worlds, um, which was periods of total shutdown and then periods of, of an increasingly packed school because we also had so many teachers out. And to me, what it proved is nobody, nobody was prepared for an emergency scenario with a school system at the brink and that that wasn't what the the unions were going to message um and then it really seemed bankrupt when you had like the leaders of the at uh, of the uh of the af uh the american federation of teachers no american teachers AFT, yeah 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 the aft yeah um uh totally almost 180 pivot the moment joe biden is elected right like that it's like okay so what was that even for right like i, mean, I, th I think that this is also though it gets back to this idea of the iron law of, the, of institutions right mm -hmm. um I, if you're arguing that you shouldn't have to go in and do your your job your public sector job taxpayer finance job you have to be really smart about how you do it but instead you get these dipshit quotes about how it's like, you know, the, the, one of the, so one of the things CTU was saying from the very beginning that people were, were calling for school, kids to go back to school was um, calls to return to school are, are uh, rooted in racism and uh, homophobia or something like that. They're, they're rooted in white supremacy or whatever, um, which is not a very compelling argument to me, but also like, you know, that's an argument that is not good for your institution, the union, but if you are union leadership and you want to remain le union leadership, right? And most of the teachers don't want to go back to the classroom and you are yelling the loudest and with the least sort of strategic restraint, then you know they're going to rally around you. And so again, it's a question of trading your, you know, the health of the institution as a whole for your position within the institution. It's uh the pernicious logic on that is kind of actually astounding. Um, and I, I agree with you. One of the things about so many of these neoliberal reforms is because they effectively didn't work are in the case of a lot of charter schools, they were locally explosive cash grabs that exploded in front of everybody. And what was funny about that is they didn't explode in the way that like, I, I read all these teachers books about 
about what charter schools were actually doing. Then I worked for one. We weren't uh, we weren't creaming. They were suppressing union stuff. They were underpaying teachers. Mm -hmm. But what they were really doing was, to be honest, was was scamming the state by double counting some things, being unbelievably irresponsible with federal uh, special education paperwork and all these other things that weren't about the students. They were just about absconding with large amounts of taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. And... For a long time, no one wanted to do anything about it because a lot of the investors were also like state level senators, but the, but the loss was getting publicized by federal action. Um, and during the Trump administration, so this is not this was not a partisan issue um, mm. because of the amount of money going through this. And this also started happening in places like California. And I think people saw how badly this went with the total charterization of the school districts in, in New Orleans, right. um, where like there was really things got worse. Um, I mean, they they talk about a New Orleans miracle, but uh, the last year that I saw, I think it was 2019 that the, Louisiana gave out grades. Um, more than half of the uh, New Orleans schools got Fs even by Louisiana's uh, low standards. So, right. That, and that's the miracle. Yeah, so it's it's uh, it's it was completely ineffective, um, and I found it very interesting. You you know you were saying this. I came to this conclusion on my own, separately from you, and I was like looking at this. I'm like, huh. So the conservative states have picked up what was originally a liberal opt out movement and turned it into a parents' rights movement, so they can get out of the tests mm -hmm. and make their test scores invalid. We, Utah was one of the first states to do this, um, but it's like a trend. But then in the liberal states. You can have a culture war about woke math um, and then close the testing down. Now, both sides in their instrumental orientation of the discourse get the discourse benefit, but the institution also gets spared the fact that it's obviously failing, right. like on every possible metric, including stuff like even before COVID, basic literacy was declining in the United States for the first time since we had total uh, you know, total post sec, uh, total secondary penetration into the country. Mm -hmm. So, since like 1972, we hadn't seen declines in relative, uh, in relative um, basic literacy. Now we've seen declines in like overall, like like yes, newspapers were written at a lower literacy table, but the idea was more people were at a basic level of literacy than before. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it meant that like the higher ends of literacy were going down. But in 2015, that, that reversed and like very little comment was made on that. Right. All right. Yeah. It was a very strange, it, and it was, again, like it just seemed like, I mean, you know, again, it was Democrats, a democratic administration, the Obama administration, which even despite the continuing loyalty of the teachers unions, would say anti-teacher shit all the time. Would say anti-union shit all the time. Arnie Duncan, Arnie, uh, Arnie Duncan did it all the time, um, and it just, and it just evaporated in a minute. You know, I mean, I think part of the, the other thing is like, look, um, I have a nuanced perspective on these testing things. Um, I wrote my dissertation on uh, educational testing, and uh, you know, the, the 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 question is is like, what problem are are the tests meant to solve, and are they solving it? And the, of course, the basic idea is like the tests tell you who is struggling and needs extra help so that you can fix them and you can and you can move up and, you know, pr produce better outcomes. Um, but that all runs aground on the fact that, as my first book said, you can't actually really fix them. Right. In other words, that like um, just the degree to which we can move quantitative educational indicators uh, relative quantitative educational indicators is just much smaller than people think that like, um, of course there are individual students who bounce around in the performance spectrum, but like on a whole, uh, it is truly remarkable how stable people's, um, <clears throat> presence is in, uh, the sort of relative, uh, hierarchy, right? I mean, it, it is genuinely the case that you can, uh, regress, kindergarten performance on senior year of high school performance and find quite a strong correlation, right? And so the question becomes then like, if the testing can't lead 
to practices that sort of fix the perceived problem, then, you know, what's the, what's the, sort of, what's the point? Um, did I ever tell you about the story of, uh, did I ever talk with you about the, uh, the French conscription st uh, uh, study, the big study about what happened when France stops kind of doing cons conscription for men? So in a, you know, France has long had this, um, this sort of uh, permanent long-term high youth unemployment problem. And uh, it, uh, um, they were trying to figure out a lot of, cl of clever ways to keep men from falling into these lives of not working and uh, living off of social welfare programs. And so they said, well, you know, men in at that point, this is in the late seventies, men in France were still required to do several years of conscription of, of compulsory military service. So they said, well, we're gonna get rid of that. And that will free up these guys for those years of their lives when they could be going to school and getting a vocation. And, and, and this is gonna improve their economic fortunes. Um, now, guys who were academically inclined were already um, getting out of the conscription. If you were like a, a star student, you were going to college anyway, right? Mm -hmm. but now this freed up all these people to do that. And so they expected, you know, we're going to see increases to the employment rate and incomes and stuff like that. Well, there's a big study about it before and after. And it not only did getting rid of conscription and freeing these guys to go to school not improve their economic fortunes at all, not only did the um, unemployment rate not get get lower not, or the average income for this group get higher, um, the number of people graduating from college barely changed. You were unleashing, um, I think, in the hundreds of thousands, or certainly in the tens of thousands, of young men to go to college uh, and to get to get the economic benefits, um, and it didn't change a thing about the number of people actually graduating, right? And this is like a thing that I I think is like a general reality in education. Yes, there was a screen keeping those guys from higher education, but taking away the screen didn't mean that they were going to go right, and. It's the same way right now where we can nominate various screens that are keeping people from going the, you know, the go to college and get a good job route. But we should probably acknowledge that there's some substantial, you know, portion of our, uh, of our particularly young men, but of our, of our young people who aren't cut out for school, who know they aren't cut out for it, who don't want to go to school and who need another path forward. And again, I think this ties into what we were talking about earlier, which is like, um, you know, uh, Democrats apparently need to endlessly be churning out more college graduates to be politically viable. And you can imagine, like, you know, men's men's college outcomes just keep getting worse and worse, right? Like, I mean, we we we're, we're legitimately at a place now uh, where it's like sixty forty in terms of women uh, getting degrees over men uh, in the system. Um, the sort of men's academic uh, uh, crisis keeps growing. And you can see like, you know, I mean, this could become a powerful voting block of very uh, angry and disaffected people who have been left behind by the system, who are not alienated by the culture of educated elite liberals um, and who have basically nothing to do. And so I think that's just like, all, this is where all this, all this winds up to me again, like this is again, the subject of my first book, but it's like, um, all of the structural adjustments we want to make to the educational system, I'm sure we can make some good ones, but they're not going to address the fundamental problem that there are people who just are not for school, right? There are simply people who are not academically inclined. And if that's both our only employment path, uh, reliable employment path now, but it's also vital to the continuing health of the, of the Democratic Party, it seems like kind of a bleak situation to me. Well, I mean... You know, um, I would even go further. See, I was looking at the stats recently for the Democrats, and then 2020 is the first year where the average income of Democrats actually went higher than the average income of Republicans. Now, it's always been the case that both of those voting blocks have like weirdly, uh, so bimodal. Yeah, bimodal voting patterns, and that's true for the Republicans too. Like, like uh, 
if you're urban poor, you are more likely to be Democratic. If you're rural poor, you're more likely to be Republican. Rural poor and urban poor are both not that likely to vote, though, period. Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of projecting. Um, but this was the first year where it actually eked up where the Democrats net were richer than the Republicans, which and that was in 2020. The other thing that changed and this became kind of apparent in the Biden election and became really apparent in the Newsom recall is that the only growth area for Democrats were college educated suburban white men. Right. Like now we just talked about the specific demographic problem that's going to lead to, but it also means like the, the progressive socialist pitch to me seems weirdly dishonest. All right, um, because we're always talking about working class this and working class that and this, that, and the other. And yes, there are working class people in the DSA in, in New York and California. I, I actually, I know that's fact, mm -hmm. but that is a very specific subset of people that has not broad appeal and I was pointing out to people like very early on, like the DSA candidates aligned with the Democrats were trying stuff like renting over exurban areas and, and, and reddish states around purple cities and stuff. And they pretty much immediately with some success in the beginning, abandoned that to running in very safe areas. And you get the sense that a lot of the people that would win as DSA candidates would have won anyway. Um, so the counter institutional tendency is not there amongst the socialists either. And the more they talk about working class issues, and I do not, I'm not one of these people who thinks having a, a bachelor's degree necessarily gets you out of the working class, but, um, and yes, there's issues with stuff like there are a lot of people with bachelor's degrees who are now poor because we've been overproducing them for so long. Uh, the other trend thing that I don't know if you've noticed but it's not just that higher education is super predictive of being democratic, that increasingly you need to be like the, the best predictor is having a graduate degree, not even a BA. Um, because I think, I think whether, I think every social study I saw indicated that yes, um, it moved people further to, a, to the left in general, about 33% of, 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 of BA and BS havers actually have a negative response to liberalism after university where they were neutral before. Yeah. Right. So that was interesting. So it's, it's not even working consistently as there. I mean, <laughs> there's always, you know, a layer of people who are, uh, who emerged from the university uh, from any university disillusioned with the whole thing, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, look, you know, I've, <laughs> I might, I might write something eventually um, I was thinking about this. I mentioned Fetterman, you know, the mm. Pennsylvania guy, um, who's a pretty, pretty far left guy in terms of policy, right? Mm -hmm. But he looks like a truck driver, right? Yep. And I think my my headline for this post might be nihilism. Political nihilism is the white pill, because to me, the hope in the whole thing is that I think it's possible that just people are just generally really fucking politically apathetic and uninformed and what all the Democrats really need to do to become viable in certain places is to just nominate people who don't look and seem like a Brown grad with an MFA in puppetry. You know what I'm saying? That like, I, I just, I, I, I've become con convinced over time that it's like, you know, it's just like the, the sense that someone somewhere is looking down their nose at you is like the most powerful force in American culture, right? The feeling that someone is being snobby towards or about you somewhere is this just deeply ingrained sort of uh, powerful and potent thing and it powers culture war. And when people ask about why do people do things against their best interests, what's up with all this false consciousness? I think a lot of that is that stuff. Now that's depressing in the sense that like you would like for our political process to have some sort of like actual internally coherent you know like like sense like be based on values and policy in some sense 
But it does mean that if that is true, then yeah, you, that you can smuggle in a lot of really progressive shit. Um, as long as you have someone who, who's like, and forget those clowns in Washington, right? Like there, that, that there's a, I, I, I mean, I think, I mean, Trump won uh, based on being this spectacle of like the anti-liberal elite, you know, uh, culture warrior when he, the guy literally has a fucking gold toilet, right? Like the, the it, so much of this, I, I just think that like in the post-Trump world, it's just about branding and exposure, right? And like, Trump got all the exposure he ever needed because he got so much cable news com- uh, uh, coverage and he just sort of acted like a lunatic and, and to put a little substance into it, stopped talking about cutting Medicare and Social Security, which was an albatross that uh, Paul Ryan was hanging around the party's neck for years. And so I just, I, I, I maintain a little bit of hope that like we'll have a guy who's a, like a John Fetterman type who um, just doesn't activate the, you know, the like, culture war, some sh- sneering shithead is trying to tell me how to live thing, you know? I'm, I'm trying to talk myself into, like, being optimistic about political nihilism. <laughs> well, I mean, the other issue, I, I think you're not wrong about the, the, uh, the voting patterns there, but the other thing I've always said is, like, well, when people co- vote on culture war stuff, look at DeSantis, they actually may eventually get what they want for. When they vote on economic stuff, they never do. Right. Like, like, I mean, that's the thing. I'm like, when people have told me, well, well, why are people voting against their best interests? And I'm like, well, I don't know. There's a, there's a democratically controlled House, a democratically controlled Senate, and a democratically controlled executive. And frankly, outside of the first uh even that was somewhat reduced but i thought of the first covid bill you got more compromise and stuff through for development under the republicans yeah and but, but i mean and it's also just just one of these things that's just like it just seems to be ex- existential to the d- democrats this is you're just such fucking sad sex who can ne- there's always a reason they can't get it done right you know what i'm saying like like you, you, you say, boy, you know, it, it sure seems like we should be getting more for our trifecta. And like Democratic stalwarts will will always default to defending the party and saying, no, you're wrong because it's cinema and it's mansion. And it's and like if there's anything that conservatives don't do is that they don't make those kind of uh, of constant like arguments for why there's a reason they're not doing anything. They just rapidly pursue their insane interests all the time. Like I and they fight each other over them too. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, but, but I mean, I just you, you know, like I, um, and again, like, uh, and voters would have to know they were voting against their best interests in that, in that uh, sort of system. But what percentage of of Trump voters could really have told you what his economic agenda was, right? Like, I mean, so if they 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 didn't even know what his that they were voting against their own best interests economically. So how can you blame them for uh, <clears throat> for doing it? I mean, certainly the media wasn't like jamming his actual economic policy down their throats. No, and his 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 speeches were pure demagoguery in the sense that if you were a certain kind of conservative who believed one thing, and you were a certain kind of conservative who believed one another thing, so if you were a war hawk conservative or are a, a paleo conservative you could listen to a trump speech and think he agrees with you yeah. like that that and he was almost unique in that regard right. but i mean yeah political nihilism is 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 interesting um you know because all these all these guys are harvard i mean with the exception of trump all these guys are harvard are, are ivy league grads i mean hey, well, trump, like, trump has a wharton degree doesn't he right yeah so yeah so it's just it's like it's it I is. Just, you know, they're floating Pete Buttigieg right now, right? So oh my what, God. what's been happening in the last couple of days is there get, there's more and more noise about how the Democrats can't elect Biden again because he's 80 million years old. And like they're clearly are sort of trying to clear the runway for Buttigieg to be the guy. And there's all of these debates about, oh, could a gay man be the presidential candidate? It's like, I, I don't think that the problem with Buttigieg is that he's gay. I think the problem with Buttigieg is that like, he just fucking he he looks like a creature made like 
by an HR software for like an inoffensive and snooty kind of a dude, right? Like it, completely independent of his sexual orientation. I think people will be just be turned off by like, he's so PMC, you know, he's just, he's so indicative of a certain kind of like educated, um, all knowing technocrat who clearly thinks he has a solution to every problem. And like, that's not the guy to roll with against Trump in 2024. That's not the guy. So it's interesting. I'm thinking about this whole, there's a couple of things that are coming to my mind. One is for all that we're talking about the, the way that universities create Democrats. Um, and, and by the way, there's going to be evidence of not just white, uh, less and less men in universities. Cause there's also evidence of decredentialization amongst like even certain kind of professional jobs because there's just not enough people anymore. Yeah. So like uh, I can give a specific example, like about a ton of the jobs at uh, an insurance company that I used to work for between the late nineties and about seven years ago, added all these degree requirements for these middle tier like quasi admin and they just got rid of all of that. Yeah. All right. Because they said they don't have the, the one, they said the college grads aren't good enough, which may or may not be true. I don't know. Um, they also, they, they admitted there's not enough of them. Mm -hmm. There's not enough recruiting pool anymore um, for that. To, now what I find, what I find fascinating about this is people talk about the greatest resignation or this and the other I'm like, we've known there was a demographic time bomb with the baby boomers forever. Mm. And I guess we just assumed they'd all work until they died. And for a lot of them, they did. Right. But um, it's 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 kind of amazing to me that no one could see this coming, right. um, particularly after COVID, because that's a, a particular high risk group and they're going to leave the workforce. Um, and so you have that. You have the fact that in most people's daily lives, it is not just that the professionals and highly educated people they're meeting are professional and highly educated and snooty. It is that they now can also assume that they're not particularly competent and they have evidence in their life. Right. I, I mean, mean I, I, that seems big. Like This is, I'm not a big um, David Graeber fan, but I, I do think that the bullshit jobs argument is, essentially correct. And I think that one of the things that sort of great unwritten tales of the last, uh, I don't know, half century um, in American life is that um, you just saw this ever increasing amount of bureaucratic layers and things and administrative roles, which seems to, to exist in a kind of backwards fashion in that like, they are, people need jobs. And so the jobs appear, right? And so you have so many of these jobs that, you know, appear to have very little value added. I mean, I was a um, administrator in CUNY uh, for uh, four years. And, uh, you know, the the higher education is a place where the uh, administrative growth has been um, most controversial and because it's just undeniable. Um, there's no reason that my job there existed, right? Um, there's no reason that my replacement should have, should, you know, I mean, I wanted to have a job, but like, um, you know, there's just so many shuffle paper jobs out there in the world right now that um, I'm always wondering and curious, like, are, are businesses going to suddenly discover, oh, we could do what we actually do uh, with dramatically fewer staff, right? Like, um, I, this is one of the things that I worried about with COVID. It hasn't come true. In fact, the, the job market is awesome now. Um, but, um, you know, what if, you know, everybody left the office for a while and they realized that they could work with skeleton crews and just sort of set loose at armies of overeducated millennials, you know, with 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 kids to feed? Um, uh, you know, I don't know. There's just there doesn't appear to be growth industries that where more jobs make sense. I mean, I, I guess the thing that some of people would say, like a guy like Richard Hernania would say is that, um, a lot of the administrative jobs are mandated by yep. uh, anti-discrimination law, 
that that um, are has, yeah, various forms of legal compliance. Yeah, yeah, all, all various kinds of legal com compliance. And the, I mean, certainly in academia, you know, if if you have a controversy, the way that you show that you care about it is that you hire somebody, right? Which is why so many of these ca uh, campus racial protests resulted in like, hey, we've got a new dean of diversity, right? Which is just like it's a, a figurehead to placate people. But, um, you know, the fastest growing jobs in this country are not in STEM, which everybody thinks they're in STEM. They're not. They're in the service industry. Most of them are low paying, low prestige service uh, industry jobs that are most people are not intended. You know, we'll never see as like this is what my job is going to be. Um, and uh, the single fastest growing job in the, in the country is home health aid, which is a completely untrained position uh, in which you just hang out with someone who's elderly or disabled and make sure they don't help themselves and help them in the bathroom and give them their meds and stuff. And the average the national pay is less than $11 an hour. Right. Right. And it, so it's just like, you know, where do people go? Like what, you know, I, what, what is the path forward? I mean, we, you know, I, I can't blame kids to try to be an influencer or to play video games online for a living because it is like, it, there, there's, there is no economic engine that seems to be require the level of employment that we have now. But then again, like I said, it's a great job market. So maybe, maybe I'm completely wrong. Well, uh, it's a great job market for now. Um, <laughs> uh, the Fed may see to that. Yeah. But, um, I mean, but that, this is the other thing about the Democrats. Let's, let's look at, let's look at this. Uh, their actual policies have been a disaster. And yeah. I, I do mean that. I mean, like, I don't think people can cut that out. So we're going to talk about the optics of all this. But while I don't think they're the reason why we have inflation, they also don't seem to have any answer for it. Mm -hmm. um, and they denied it was going to be a long term problem in the beginning of the Biden administration over and over again. Now, admittedly, most people don't listen to political news, so they don't know that. But people who do are being soured on it, too, which makes me wonder, like, about that subsection of white, educated, suburban growth that they saw, how loyal that's going to be. Right. And I, the evidence is not very. Mm -hmm. So, so it well, that, that was, remember, that was, uh, what was his name? Not Robbie Mook, uh, maybe David Axelrod or someone like that, mm -hmm. like that. Um, this, this, his theory of the election in 2016 was for every one Rust Belt um, working class white voter we lose, we'll gain two suburban uh, uh, educated professionals, right? Um, but, which that, some, but that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't many work. Urban educated professionals. Right, yeah. Like, so, um, <laughs> I don't know, man. So, you know, I, I have a really long-standing core belief that I always try to maintain, which is that now is not special. Like I, I always try to remind myself that like our experience as conscious beings is always to think that now is special because we're here now. And I'm always telling people, look, this isn't a uniquely dark time for American life. It's not a uniquely good time for American life. This isn't the end of an era. This isn't, you know, this is, this is just life. It just keeps going. You know, things that are super big political news today won't be a big deal tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but having said that, I don't know, man. It, it does seem like there is the potential for some, like, really country-shaking economic bad times right now in a way that could completely scramble the uh, political picture. Yeah, and, and I feel like because of the... the um the way the Democrats have handled this, they're particularly vulnerable to uh, being crushed on this issue. I mean, um, for the for most of my life, uh, until about 2008, Republicans were seen as better stewards of the economy. Then the 07 crash happened, and that finally broke. Um, the Democrats have more or less reversed the trend uh, back to that norm. And it's hard for me even rationally to argue that people aren't being rational about that because I mean, I was pointing out to someone like, look, when you talk about the end with like, what, I remember that in the middle of the Trump administration, when you talk about the decline of like rural and suburban 
wives they're like oh you're just privileging white people i'm like but but net life expectancy is going down for people who make under eighty thousand dollars a year right. Right. for the first time in like a hundred fucking years right. like that's not small nor does that just white privilege correcting itself nor frankly does it just affect white people like i got tired of being like the opioid epidemic is you guys talking about white people i'm like that affects a lot yeah. of people yeah um I, I, and I guess maybe we can just close with me complaining yeah. about capitalism, but um, I mean, we had decade after decade of a slack job market, which helps to contribute to little or perhaps no real wage growth. Right. Right. The famous decoupling of economic growth and wage growth that happens in the mid 1970s um, <clears throat> continues to, you know, up until the present day, um, the, uh, the employer has the upper hand in everything uh, in the job market for decades and decades. We have high uh, long-term unemployment, a lot of people permanently dropping out of the, uh, of the economy, dropping out of the labor force. Um, we get to a unique uh, sort of moment with the pandemic and we create the conditions where suddenly for the first time in my lifetime, right? The, uh, employee or potential employee, the job applicant, kind of has the upper hand, has negotiating power, has options, and is looking at the very real possibility of more uh, salary. And the fucking minute it happens, the system starts to collapse because of inflation, right? Like, like we, like we, we are, we are, we're just trailing behind, you know, the, the Fed's projections of what we should have in terms of wage growth and uh, and unemployment for decades. We finally get to a position that might appear to benefit the worker rather than uh, the boss. And it, at the minute that that happens, suddenly gas is five dollars a gallon, and all your all the the wage growth that you might have just gotten has been yep, eaten. It's up. Gone. It's, it's a fucked system. It's just, it's, inf right. it's infuriating. It, it, it's it's madness. And what's even more madness is when they're like, well, inflation's because of wage growth. And I'm like, but the percentage of your profits that are being paid out in wage growth actually declined since 2019. Right. So, you know, right. and I'm not saying it's just greed. I mean, I actually think it's a very complex issue with, with, with supply chains and all kinds of shit and many things popping off at once because you had a stress test during COVID and we failed basically like, um, uh, in, you know, and I'm with you on the, on the, you should not assume that you live in a unique time, except that it's really hard for me right now to look at a bunch of these indicators and not going like, this is weird. Yeah. Like, um, so with all that said, I guess, uh, uh, I see I see progressives as having two things they can do. Um, one of which will put them in the political wilderness for a while um, and is legally very hard to do. And the other is uh, probably not going to happen, but would be easier. One, one is to cut ties with the toxic brand of the Democrats because they have no institutional reason not to continue doing what they're doing. But if you do that, admittedly, because of all the legal reforms from the 60s forwards, it's very hard to to get ahead anywhere. I mean, like, there's a reason why we haven't had a massive party shift um, since the 60s. Right. Um, yeah. And particularly after Ross Perot, they, they really made right. sure that shit wasn't going to happen again. Right. We'll see. And we'll see. And the other thing is that the Democrats could start, could stop their current trends but you're right. I don't see any institutional reward for them doing that. And in fact, it seems like it seems like right now the institutional and discourse in Orsha is so much in the opposite direction that they would rather die and lose for a generation than change what they're saying. And that's wild to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, it might take a lot of losing for, for things to change. It might be the only way that that, that happens. Well, and on that cheering note, I'd like to thank you for coming on. Do you have anything you want to plug? Nope. Uh, FridayToBoard.substack.com and my first book, uh, The Call to Smart, is available uh, on Amazon and sundry other online uh, retailers. All right. Thank you so much, Freddie. All right. Thanks.